All right, hey everybody, how are you? It's Charlie here, and I just finished a paid coaching call with a group of students of mine uh, around appointment booking and sales, specifically how to get more appointments and how to close deals for marketing agencies. I've served 300 different marketing agencies and consulted with them on how to fix bottlenecks in their client acquisition processes. And today, I wanna share with you a call that I did with, I think, like 20 or 30 of my paying clients, where we talk all about different things from metrics to business strategies to ad copy to sales scripts and sales sales training. I also give um, examples of like how I would pitch people when it comes to sales calls. I review clients' metrics to do with their appointment booking. There's a lot of little nuggets, I suppose you could call them throughout this video. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'm going to cut the clip in now. Without further ado, let's begin. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome to the 26th of September coaching call. Hope you guys are all well. Just to confirm from the people with cameras on, can you hear me and see me? Cool. Thank you very much. Brilliant. All right, guys. Well, welcome. Um, anyone joining us for the first time, it's great to have you. The way these calls run is any questions you have, type them out, pop them in the chat, and we'll go through and take the time to answer them. Um, obviously, we ask that questions are concise, and um, if I need context with regards to any situations, I will request. So, guys, don't be shy. I am here for the next hour or so. We're going to try and keep this one to an hour as per usual. Um, so yeah, let's hop into these questions and um, looks like we've got a couple to kick us off. So let's do it. All right. Okay, so Dominic starting. Hey, Dominic. I have a service in mind that would potentially make more money for my niche, but it needs to be tested to see how well it works. How would I go about structuring an offer where I can't put a guarantee since it needs to be tested first, should I put a guarantee anyways and just refund the people the money if it doesn't work anyways? I believe it'd be much harder to sell without a guarantee or refund Trojan horse. Yeah, I would do the Trojan horse thing here. Or like, if it's, see if you can just get a paper appointment type deal, depending on what the nature of the service is. Yeah, that's what I would do there. Because you're only gonna sell it if you, feel confident in it so that's what i would do best material to put on my facebook or instagram profile as a beginner i don't have case studies and honestly not that much experience in smma so i'm wondering what kind of materials i could post to be able to make clients feel capable and confident in my abilities you can make like resources generally speaking you just want to give the vibe that you know what you're talking about so i would make like videos just talking about ads like short form video content like what makes a great ad headline for chiropractors, for example, Logan. And then it can just be like you just talking for like two minutes. And if you just have like five pieces of content like that, maybe you produce like a PDF or something and there's just a loom of you running through it. Like it, it shouldn't take you more than two hours to put all that stuff together. The content doesn't have to be long or particularly detailed, but that's what I would do. Why can you review, review my loom metrics? Yep, yeah, if you send them in the chat, mate, make sure it's available for me to view. We'll have a look. Drum roll, please. One sec, one second, please. All right, mate, <laughs> whilst you dig up the spreadsheet, I'm gonna move on to the next question, okay? Yeah. Cool, and when I finish with that one, we'll go to your metrics. Um, Toby, how's it going, mate? Good to be here, good to have you. A um, couple of questions. I'm just starting out in the gym niche. I want my service delivery to be the best. My current plan is to watch all the service deliveries and gym growth accelerator videos. I think the best way to learn is through practice, but with zero clients, what other steps would you recommend to improve? I would recommend every opportunity you get reviewing what competitors are doing, right? So Facebook ads library, find the people that are crushing it, Pull apart the copy that seems to be working, um, the funnels that are working for different gyms, how they structure everything, basically. You can emulate your way to 10 grand a month. Getting to 100 is a lot harder by copying, but it's possible. Um, and also, <clears throat> the main thing, man, is just try and get a client. Because <laughs> if you get a client, it will force you to, the, the, the process, like if forever, you can watch videos and prepare for a client forever, but if you sign one and they pay you, it really kicks you into gear. You'll learn more <clears throat> in a one week period when someone's paid you than you could in a three month period when you're sitting on your hands. 
And then I imagine 95% of my prospects will have been pitched by North Flow Gym Launch or someone else in this program before. Why would someone choose me? That's a good question. Because the problem probably still exists for them. You've got to realize with North Flow, man, like we kept clients for a long time, but eventually clients would always go to another agency that they thought would be better. <laughs> So like we had one client that we kept like 11 months and then they left us because another agency pitched them a better offer and then the agency fucked them, right? So I wouldn't really worry too much about that, man. And also you should just commit to being absolutely unbelievably brilliant at it. And then that's why they choose you. It's kind of like when we started Imperium, like we had nothing. <laughs> like Why would anyone choose us? It's like, well, because we were committed to being the best basically. Okay, so Hwai has sent his Loom metrics through. Uh, Hwai, can you just confirm for me on the mic that you can see my screen? Yes. All right. Well, it doesn't look pretty. I just want to figure out if I'm doing something wrong. My first question is, why is the volume so low? I have no objection to the question, really. Um, because when you're only sending 20 a day, you have to send like for 10 days and then do all the follow-ups to know whether or not your variables are going to work or not. The more volume you have, the more iterations you can develop. Whereas here, you've only really had the opportunity to do what, like two or three tests. So there's going to be a few variables that come into this, right? So the first thing and the most important thing is your loom view, right? Mm -hmm. Because I see here you introduced a new loom, mm -hmm. but if your loom view rate is like 7%, it doesn't really matter. So can you send me your copy in the chat, please? The loom uh, script, you mean? not the loom, the actual copy of the email itself, because the first bottleneck we're running into here, from my perspective, is the loom view rate. I mean, we need to get this loom view rate up because we can't really accurately test the script until it's higher. Because these numbers here, like you might be like, oh, but my, my ABR is only 0.61%. It's like, well, we've only had 20 people look at the loom. So we don't know the efficacy of that metric, basically. Do you want me to just copy and paste? Uh... No, could you send me the um, Google Doc and then give me permissions to edit it, please? Sure. So the problem is not with the loom, but it's probably the copies, not you saying. Well, what do these metrics tell you? So you email 100 not... people and only seven of them will actually look at the loom. Not people are, are reading, are opening the emails, I guess. Probably not opening. But if you send me the copy, we'll take a look. Yes, sure. Whilst you're doing that, I'm going to see if I can find. We had some copy that worked very well in the gym space. Let me see if I can dig out. Hey, Nicholas, I just received a DM, mate, for, with your question. Um, could you send that in the general Zoom chat just so that when we upload the, the recording, the person uploading the recording can snag the question, if that makes sense. Um, just see in one second for me, mate. Okay. Let's have a gander at this copy. Now, a couple of other questions, why? How do you know your deliverability is good? Um, so I test the emails every week, the beginning of the week and the end of the week. Um, and then, so yeah, that's what I do. Using the, the test um, doctor thing that you posted. You the, sent to friends and family recently? Um, I sent to people in the group. 
Okay, and oh, you're sure yeah. you're going to the inbox? Yeah. So what I'm going to do here um, is scroll down and you do it consistently. I want you to increase your volume. 20 a day is child's play. Okay. You want to be doing 100 a day, right? Okay. So if not 50, at least, um, because at least if you're sending 50, you can get a test done every week. Right. And remember, like the, the, the key to client acquisition is iteration. Right. We're not going to get it right the first time around. We're not going to get it right the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time. But maybe the tenth time, that's when we start to develop some success. And if you're only sending 20 a day, it's going to take you six months to even run those tests. And by that point, you'll probably have given up because the results aren't there because the volume's so low. 20 looms a day is like going to run ads and only spending like a dollar a day. It doesn't give us enough data to make decisions. So change that copy, increase the volume, continue your deliverability um, tests. And once we see this loom view rate closer to 15%, then we can actually start looking at the loom to figure out what's wrong with it. The issue is now we just simply don't have enough loom views to know what the hell is going on, right? Because, you know, you can see here, if we sent 20 emails in one day and got no replies, we wouldn't think anything of it because it's only 20 emails. But if we get 20 loom views in total and only get one or two replies, it's the same situation. We can't make anything of it because we haven't got the data to make the decision. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. The new version of the program will teach this in very heavy detail, by the way, guys. Um, more specifically, systems thinking and how Bo and I use metrics and stuff. So you, yeah, that was, that's on the way. So yeah, nice one, Hawaii. Um, Jesper says, what would you wish you had changed in your paradigm since starting out? Probably what I just went through with why. <laughs> um, thinking in systems and metrics and data. Those are really big ones. And then basically all the mindset module. <laughs> um, the mindset module contains the majority of the paradigm shifts that I had with reference to mindset that all fed into the business. But I think that would be the, the main one. And also not worrying as much about things. Like not letting myself get emotional or anxious or like letting emotion get involved in the company. It's something I've got a lot better at this year specifically is emotionally detaching myself from the business because let's say you're like like why system we just looked at there right so you're looking at uh, some numbers and the thing is is if you feel emotion towards that spreadsheet then that emotion will begin to interrupt your ability to objectively observe what the system is actually telling you and you'll start to see it for how you want to see it not how it actually is and that's the, that's the thing that fucks everyone at the beginning, the emotions. And it's hard to, to learn to separate those. But you think when Jeff Bezos looks at Amazon sales reports, he's feeling any ounce of emotion? No. Right. Eric says, what do you say when people say they don't have money left in their marketing budget? It's my biggest objection right now. and I don't know how to handle it. Yeah, it's a very simple rebuttal, Eric. You can just frame it like this. You can say, look, if your marketing was working, you wouldn't even have a budget. It's a very nice little one-liner. I don't understand marketing budgets at all because if, some, if you're investing in something and it's producing more results, if you put a dollar in and you put $2 out, why would you put a budget on that? <laughs> so people that have marketing budgets are just investing money into the wrong place. And if you can bring that to their attention and make it clear to them, then... I mean, dude, have, you can have a budget for how much money you spend on company fuel, or you can have a budget on how much you spend on offices. You should never have a budget on how much you spend on growth if it's actually growing the company. So it's just reframing their perspective, Eric, to advise them, hey, well, I understand, but with us, you won't want to have a budget because if you give us a thousand dollars, we'll give you three thousand. You telling me you'd want to cap that? And then you shut up and let them just the whole argument just crumbles basically do you have to do it clever you have to do it intelligently because well, there's a bit of a ironic statement you have to do it clever 
you have to do it intelligently and cleverly where you ask them it as a question as opposed to a statement. Neil says, hey, Charlie, how do I stay focused and mentally sharp when having three sales calls back to back? Dude, you try doing like six back to back five days a week, man. <laughs> That's when it gets hard. But I understand. Um, you just get used to it. Yeah, the more the, the more calls you do, the more you fall into a rhythm and pattern, and the less you have to think. I think that's one thing that I learned doing sales calls is you eventually become this machine, and you start your work day. Let's say you've got eight calls a day consistently, like I did when I was doing full sales for Northflow and Imperium at the start. You just become a machine. You just start the call, the first call, and then before you know it, it's it's like six p.m. and the day's done, and you've closed like three clients. What, the more volume you do, the more accustomed your mind becomes to it and the better you can, you can conserve mental energy. So what starts to happen is when you ask prospects certain questions is you'll just switch off and you'll pay attention to the key details that you know are important through the patterns that you've noticed after doing 100 calls or so. But then you'll switch off and you'll just you'll start to conserve energy. Fun fact for you guys, and I I, I, I chose to not mention this to anyone for a long time, but when it got to the point with Imperium where I was doing eight calls a day and building the product and growing the business, during the questioning phase of every single sales call I did for Imperium, I played Call of Duty. And I'm not, and that, that sounds like it's almost too good to be true and a lie. But what I would do is I'd, the reason I did this is to conserve energy. I'll, I'll explain because it sounds controversial, but when you you can't do this, this is not advice, right? <laughs> you can't really do this until you've done thousands of calls. But when you're at that point, what starts to happen is you can switch off and you can just convert. It's kind of like, you know, you look at a, a fucking quarterback in the NFL and they throw a ball and they don't even have to think. What I used to do when I was doing eight calls a day for Imperium, whilst managing and building a team, whilst building a product, working 12 to 14 hours a day, it becomes excruciatingly difficult to do all those things at once. So what I did is I plugged my Xbox in to my monitor that I was doing calls on. Or no, I'd, I'd have my laptop on my desk and my Xbox plugged into my monitor. And I'd go and put a pillow over my controller Right, so they couldn't hear me clicking around on the controller. And for the first twenty minutes of the call, I would I I'd, I knew the questions off by heart. I didn't even like you know have to do anything. I would just play Call of Duty. And the reason I did that is because it allowed me to disengage for that twenty minutes. And what that meant is if each call was twenty minutes of questioning, and I had like eight of them, then what's that? I had like an extra like hour and a half or so of brain that I didn't have to use. But that you can't do that for a long time. But Neil's to answer your question, that's how I basically did it, but I wouldn't recommend that until you're so capable to the point that you can actually just do it with your eyes closed. Yeah. So you get used to the emotion of closing or losing as well, right? After Dude, a while. It just falls, it go, you're just, it all, go, it all goes away. Because like, um, the more you do, just the easier it gets. <laughs> because I'm actually like, I just closed one and I'm not trying to like celebrate because you it's a double edged sword, right? If you celebrate too much, you put it on a on a big stool in front of you. It's this big thing, but you should just not look no, at it you that should, way. You should celebrate closing clients. What you don't want to celebrate is a monthly revenue because that becomes your limit. But if you close a client, you should feel the strong emotion and carry that into the next call because it will give you confidence in yourself. But eventually okay. when you'll you'll get to a point when if you are doing like eight back to back, it becomes less about the clothes and the money and more about the person's life being changed. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that's how I did it, man. Like eight calls a day. And the, the ironic thing is I learned about this, like I'd get the best kill streaks playing Call of Duty when doing sales calls, because I wasn't really playing the game, but I wasn't really doing the sales call. I was sort of in this middle space. So I wasn't thinking about the game, which meant all my intuition, my God knows how many thousands of hours of Call of Duty I played. But yeah, that was, you know, and a lot of people would look at that and think like, that's awful. That's the worst advice anyone could give. And it would be in the situation that wasn't complicit with what mine was, but yeah, it's just something that I used to do to just, just reserve that cognition, especially because our pitches were so long and like the objection handling, um, you can't do it with objection handling. You have to pay attention, but yeah. that's insane, man. Thank you. Yeah. And you'll find that you'll, that you, you will notice patterns. So like with agency owners, if I asked them like, like, you want to get 10 grand a month. Why there's only really ever going to be like four or five answers that are very universal 80% of the time. So you can just fall into patterns, but 
Yeah, that's kind of how. Nicholas says, hey, Charlie, I had the idea to do the gym niche in the Hispanic speaking part of the world. Do you think it's a good idea? Yeah. Because I think there's not like, like there's a lot of, um, let's say, really good competitors in the United States, but probably like if I go to the Hispanic speaking part of the world, everyone's like, where's, you know? Yeah, dude. If you reached out, to, I can guarantee you that nobody's ever reached out to gyms in Spain before. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's the point. It just depends, yeah. like, because obviously this is not a racist generalization, but you're going to find certain Spanish speaking countries won't have the GDP or economic wealth. Yeah, the money. Like I thought about that. But what if I do like structure kind of the offer that I kind of watch the gym uh, launch thing you made? Uh, and what if I uh, structure an offer where uh, all the money that is made from the um, how do you call it? Like the free thing you, you used on high level? Um, yeah, but it's know? not about how much the gym has to pay you. It's about how much the citizens of this country have to pay the gym. So if you look at the US, the average, um, the average monthly membership for a independently owned group fitness style gym in the US is around $120, for example, if you're in CrossFit. Yeah. If you go to somewhere like Mexico, for example, you'd probably find it's $10. Right. So if you're working with the US, you've got the advantage of them being able to pay you more because they get paid more. But the, the bottleneck, the constriction economically there is going to come from the customers, not the, not the gym. But either way, I'd still explore like if Mexico City, for example, you might find that it's wealthier, like the capitals. But I'd give it a go. Definitely. OK, but um, should I just like give it a go and like full send it for like a couple of years or should I test it out or? What do you think? Because I was thinking maybe go with like a lower G I know, for example, in Mexico, um, Mexico City, especially um, there's like the rich part, the rich areas um, charge the same or more than in the United States. I've seen it. I lived it. I think, yeah, I think like you shouldn't just full send it for a couple of years. I think you should just test it. Because I, I would tell you to full send the gym niche for a couple of years because I know that there's successful agencies in the gym niche. But what you're trying to do isn't something that's been done before. So you don't want to full send something that we don't know is going to work or not. But I'd test it for a month or two, a couple of months, definitely. You'll find it easier no. to acquire clients. Yeah. I mean, if you have, like, I was, sorry, just to the last point. I was like, I thought about that and I was like, maybe like you get um, the sales training and stuff like that from maybe lower GDP countries. So when I uh, click into maybe this, this pain, um, countries like that is maybe basically the same money as in the United States. Uh, I have like a much higher conversion rate and a good product and stuff like that. I'll give it a go. Okay. Good luck. Good man. Cool. Hey, Theo, how's it going? I'm the founder of a marketing agency. Our ideal prospect is looking to increase inline revenue with their KPIs. The thing that's stopping them from getting there is knowledge, time, or trust. Here are the offer we have created. We help e-commerce retailers already doing a minimum of 50k a month increase their revenue by at least 20% within nine days. Theo, have you been through the um, offer module? In the program um i only joined the course on friday uh i've been through the foundation lesson and then i've been through the workflow to creating an offer but only part one gotcha. i might be premature on asking this question then. yeah it's only because um if you go through um parts one through four in organic attraction at the end there's um a template for an offer audit and it breaks it all down and then you can just pop it in the group and then we can just audit it and it's usually a lot more straightforward you look it looks like you're on the right path but without like the full picture it's hard to be like yeah. yeah that's good if that makes sense okay cool yeah I, I, that's uh that's all good thank you cool. Cool. more scene how's it going which is better sending emails with the software or manually because i think it's hard to stay consistent if i send them manually manually is better yeah manually is better we are exploring softwares that seem to be producing results, but for every, if, if, if I put a hundred people in a room 
Like if I, let's say I put 200 people in a room and a hundred of them were sending manually consistently properly, a hundred of them and a hundred of them were using softwares, the hundred people doing it consistently manually would get better results. There's just too many other things that come into the equation when you automate it. Yeah, because, uh, sorry, Charlie, but sometimes like with the service delivery and like I have too much work to do because I do the service delivery, which I'm a slack off. Uh, so I thought that uh, maybe with a software that do it like every day could be better. Why don't you hire a virtual assistant? Yeah, that's the thing I need to do, I, I guess. Yeah, I mean, like, the if, if you are, it makes sense to outsource appointment booking or more specifically sending of those emails and recording of those looms when you're in a position where you're doing, you're too busy with existing clients that you haven't got the time to acquire new ones. That's when you would hire, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Best ways to research competitive strategies when it comes to getting results. The way I do it is looking through the Facebook ad library, but I'd appreciate some areas you could shed some light. The only one I know of is Facebook ads library. Or reach out to the competitors pretending to be a client and say, hey, I'm looking for a new agency, but I just want to make sure that the ads that you use aren't ones that I've already tried before with other agencies. Can you send me some examples? <laughs> it's a bit naughty, but... Most of them will probably do it. Mahi Matija? Matia? 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 I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, it might not be a silent J, but I hope I am, man. Um, I don't know if this is the right place to ask, but I'm having trouble with the blacklisting. I've been blacklisted three times. Yeah, it doesn't matter. If you're blacklisted, like I say in the training, if you're blacklisted two or three times, it doesn't matter. It's only when you get like four or five or six that it starts to become a problem. So you don't have to worry about the two, the three. You're probably on Sorbs, Spam House, and some other one that doesn't matter. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. None. Toby says, thanks for the helpful answer to my first two questions. I'm not confident in my service delivery at the moment, and I know how important conviction is in sales. When do you think I should start outreach? Now. Like, you have to ask yourself, how are you going to become confident in service delivery? It's like, well, through doing, like, how do you get better at it? It's like, well, you do it. It's like, well, how do you do it? You get clients. So you don't have, like, you need to have conviction to acquire clients, but you don't need to have huge amounts of conviction to acquire clients that are small and trial-based or commission-based or something like that. So just start it now, man. I don't think there's any excuse for delaying outreach ever at all. How much do you pay your VA per 100 loons? And did your appointment booking rate drop after hiring them? So with regards to the second question, like a tiny bit, but if you have tight controls and good people, KPIs will generally stay as you want them to. Like hiring someone or outsourcing something is not the thing that would cause a drop in results. It's hiring the wrong person. It's a really important distinction. Like people are like, oh, Charlie, when you outsource sales, did your KPI drop? It's like, it's not the hiring that causes the problem. It's who you hire. So how much did you pay your VAs per 100 looms? So I, I figured this out. I, I pay them basically by how many looms they can make per hour. So what that looks like is, let's say the loom takes two minutes to record. So an hour, an hour sorry, one minute and 30 seconds to record. 30 seconds to name and upload to a sheet. So two minutes per loom packaged and ready to deliver. That's 30 looms an hour, right? They're working efficiently as they should be. We tend to not factor in things like toilet breaks, which now I think about it is a little bit unethical, but anyway, um, I'm gonna probably look into that. But so we can do 30 looms an hour. So what I then do is I'd look at the VA I'm working with and what's your hourly rate? It's four dollars. All right, we'll pay you four dollars for every thirty looms you record. Here's the maths, and then that's how it works. So they're three bucks an hour. Then I would pay them nine dollars for a hundred looms, maybe a little bit more because there's an extra ten. <laughs> Key takeaway: play video games during sales calls new matter. 
Now, I wanted to clarify that is not advice that I'm giving to people. <laughs> you need to pay attention and make sure that you're listening properly and don't try and multitask, but eventually you, you can. And it's a cool luxury, but I did what I had to do because I found that after eight calls, I was just completely wiped out and I had nothing to put into the product. But when I removed the, the brain from having to listen to people's answers really deeply, it got a lot easier and because I was able to retain silence and stuff and I didn't have to think basically. <laughs> the better you become on Call of Duty, the more money you make. Are you sponsored by the new Modern Warfare 2 remaster? No, but I bought it and I'm quite disappointed by it, to be honest with you. Discussion for another day. Max says, currently redoing my onboarding call agenda. Trying to keep it short and sweet. What do you think of one, welcome, a little bit about us, about what we do. Two, how our system works. Three, how to maximize your personal results. Four, expectations. Five, reporting and systems, communication. Six, questions, next step. What, what, what's this for, Max, after you've acquired a client, right? Yeah, so I have, a, uh, I have an onboarding call today, so... I uh, just wanted to, and the last one was a bit of a shambles. So I'm just trying to redo the agenda of what we actually talk about on the for the call. I think the best way to do the call would be not do it. Really? Like just do a loom. Yeah, honestly, I'm I'm thinking about that. It's just it's just the way that like I don't know. I've I've always done it that way, so I've just never never thought about not doing it. But yeah, I want to just build out funnels like a. Uh, a funnel with just a series of looms to be able to save so much time. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point, a, actually. It's usually not the best. That's a good point. Oh, I've always done it that way, so that's just how I do it. Yeah. It's a really important <laughs> yeah. lesson. Like, look at your company and look at the things that you do and then ask yourself, why do I do it like that? And if the answer is something along the lines of like, oh, it's just how I've always done it. It's like, okay, well, you made the decision to do it that way when you started your company, which is when you were the least intelligent version of yourself you've ever been. Yeah. So why are you continuing to behave in accordance with that person? You get my point. But with regard, obviously you've got this call today. You don't want to cancel it. It might be a bit awkward. It's very straightforward. You just say, hi, how's it going? Perfect. All right. Here's what we need to do. And then you just run through a to-do list. Don't, don't, don't be like, don't spend five minutes like, being their friend and then telling them about the company and just be like, all right, what are you here for? Brilliant. 30 meetings a month. All right. I've got a little to-do list and run through it. Is that right? But dude, I wouldn't even do that. I just do looms. We used to onboard every North flow client, mm -hmm. um, using looms or some sort of video, not even a funnel, dude. I just use Google docs <laughs> and like I'd create yeah, like the, the yeah. Google drive they needed and stuff. And then it would just be done. Yeah, I'll just have like a uh, different like headings for each uh, category, like the ones I just I listed wonder, out, and then a loom for each different one, maybe. Can, let me see if I can find this from my done few days when I was working with some online personal trainers. Um, shit, where's my Google Drive? Hang on, I'll see if I can dig it up for you quickly, mate. But you'll see, you'll see sort of like the nature of it. Okay. Uh, Hmm. Uh, my old folders a few miles back. I'm pretty sure. Here we go. Uh, did I have a form? I had a form. Definitely had a form. Hang on. Yeah, here you go. Look. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was back in like 2019. It's like two years ago. Okay. Um, like I would literally just, this would be for, um, no, this was, that we used this for Northflow, but this was for my initial agency, but I didn't use it. I was editing it for Northflow when I did this, but I literally just sent them an email. <laughs> and then I had this like onboarding video, which yeah, it won't work anymore because the website isn't hosted anymore. But like, I just sent them an email, like we're excited. There's a few things we need to get to agreements attached. Can you sign it? Here's a video explaining everything. 
And then I create like a Google Drive specifically for them and then link it and be like, here's your Google Drive link where you need to upload your images and everything. And then I'd be like, if you want good results, do these two things. This is where we had the golden follow-up process and some um, sales training that we let organize into a program. And then as an organization, we care more about your success. Um, go through these resources. And then in summary, what was it? I can't remember what this is. I think this is like some, no, it's probably not gonna work. And then basically in summary, we need access to MailChimp, Zapier, Lead Owl, Calendly, access to your business manager and images. And that was all walked through on the video. And then I just, I didn't even send it myself. <laughs> I sent it as support. So if they replied, I didn't have to reply to them. So that makes that sense. That makes sense. Like yeah, hundred percent. The, the whole purpose of an onboarding system should be to get the client to share information about their business that you need to do your job. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's yeah, like you said, you've just got to look at it and think what purpose does that actually serve, and it's nothing. It's just because, like, even in my case, I don't even need the the visuals, any media. It's literally just logins and just running through like what to expect, and that can just easily be done in a loom. So yeah, yeah let's just save a lot of time. You can set the expectations on the sales call. Um, yeah. Like you want to, as a business owner, you want to avoid meetings at every opportunity. But that's also something that I've tried to optimize for this year is at every chance I get, can you send me an email instead of having a meeting? And if, if, if no, send me a loom. It's like, it's like, it goes in this hierarchy. It's like meeting, right? And I'll, instead of a meeting, I'll see if it can be, like a text message, right? Yeah. And if it can't be a text message, I'll see if it can be a text email. And if it can't be a text email, I'll see if it can be a voice note. And if it can't be a voice note, I'll see if it can be a loom. If someone wants to get on a call with me, I ask them to do those, like, can it be this? Can it be this? Can it be this? Can it be this? And then if not, then we do the call. But So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Should I send looms of my personal email while my new emails are warming up? Yes, it's soft. It's with a soft J. That's great. Yes, I would do that from your personal email whilst you're warming up, provided you're not like heartbroken if that goes to spam for a few months after you blitz through it. So, yeah. Can you please allow me to edit the Loom metric spreadsheet? You need to go to file and then make a copy. So, I'll show you this. Right, if you open a, a spreadsheet here, right, any spreadsheet. If you wanna make your own copy and edit it yourself, you go to file, make a copy, and then it goes into your Google Drive. If you edit the one that you see, then it'll edit it for everyone. Um, guys, gonna take a quick two minute break, and um, if there's no more, no more questions when I get back, we'll wrap the call up.
Okay. All right. Yeah, go for it, Max. Uh, yeah, so I have a... Uh, it's probably best if I share my screen, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one second. Cheers. Dude, how long... I've been using Zoom for so long and I still struggle to figure out how to let people share their fucking screen. <laughs> like, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, yeah, so I have this um, client management sheet and so I get them to... Um, so I get them to fill this out basically along with like a uh, Google survey. So just so I have all their information in one place. <clears throat> and I was just thinking on this, I could make it even more efficient and just put the funnel in here. Do you think that would work? It's just a, it's just like a, a questions about their niche. Like this is just for service delivery and then um, their details, stuff like this, uh, stuff to help with outreach. And then I was just thinking I could probably just have another sheet down here uh, call it like system expectations and, and stuff like that and then just put the funnel in there and just link Why different even, looms what's the funnel for but when i say funnel i just mean what we were just talking about like the um just the different loom videos oh okay yeah yeah i would just have like a loom video like one loom video that just runs through the whole thing and then send yeah, them okay. and be like, here's your sheet, here's a loom okay. explaining sheet. Send it back to me in the next three days. Okay, so I'll, I'll just maybe write out a script for that for that 30 minute loom. Doesn't it just need go, to be scripted, great. man. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, you're overcomplicating it massively. Yeah. Just be I like, so. all right, hey, it's Max. Really excited to work with you. So this is the onboarding form. If you can just run through and answer these questions for me. That'd be really helpful. As much detail as you possibly can will be will be really useful. So here's how, basically we need your login details. So if you can provide these, that'd be great. And then video offer and copy, tracking SOPs documents, right? You can probably do it in like eight minutes. Mm, yeah, so, okay, so this, obviously this has to be done, but then I'll just add in a video, just going through each just going through exactly what, them, what i need send them an email with stuff. send them an email with the loom that explains yeah. the whole process and then send them the things they need in that process Does that make sense yeah so like, but then will you know, that will that loom also go over expectations and stuff like that i think it should yeah okay all right cool got it be like zero point like sheet zero expectations yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Very good. Mm. Fairly certain I'll be getting meetings this week. Other than playing Call of Duty, what are the main points I need to focus on when questioning, pitching, and objection handling? It's a good question. That's what the sales modules for, mate, to be honest. Like the main thing with questioning is listening, silence and sounding genuinely interested and asking all the questions. And then pitching is just conviction and pace. Tell them also telling them information that is actually relevant to them and not using just random words to make it sound good. What I mean by that is not like being overly verbose, just getting to the point and explaining it properly. And then with objection handling, it's if you do the pitching and the questioning and answering their questions well, the objections will be a lot easier to handle. Now, the main thing with objection handling is just not believing a word they say, but also making it sound like you do. So what I mean by that is if someone says, oh, Charlie, like, I always think about it before making these decisions. If I believe that, then I'll never handle the objection. So I always tell my sales reps, it's like, in an objection situation, the prospect will buy your confidence or you will buy their doubt. There's only one of two outcomes when someone raises an objection. You let their frame seep into yours and let their emotional state determine yours or they let your emotional state determine theirs. Someone comes at you with a ton of doubt and you buy it, then it will never close. But just watch the sales module, mate, as often as you can. <laughs> And practice okay. as well, like practice, practice. Like people think that they need sales calls to practice. You don't, you can do it in your head. Also for um, the questioning part, 
I noticed you said you want to sound really interested, but also in the module, it basically says, just say, okay. And then like, next question, how do you kind of pair those together? Sound interested, but also be short and just like, okay. And on to the next question. Oh, Logan, tell me, mate, what motivated you to book today's call? Okay. You mentioned you've got a problem to do with client acquisition and you're really struggling. Why? Okay. You see my point? So the interest and mm -hmm. the curiosity is conveyed in the way you ask the questions and the okay solidifies to the prospect. You've got enough information to move on to the next one. Okay. Thank you. Would it be helpful if I gave you an example pitch or just if I pitched you something, what are you selling? Chiro, I'm doing paid advertisement for chiropractors right now, on Facebook, but I'm thinking I might move to like TikTok or something. Why? Because it would be more of a kind of like pizzazz. People seem to like TikTok and also the video. I can make the videos myself and it would probably have a lower CPM. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not going to do an example pitch on the spot for that now, actually. Um, okay. But there's, if you listen to the um, examples in the program, you can probably find them out. The thing with the pitching is it's like, it's just so, like, okay, so I'll just give you a quick, like, 20 second, right? So it's like, Logan, all right, mate. So what we've established is you're running this chiropractic practice, right? And you're currently making around 10K. You want to get to the point where you're doing 50K a month. We've, we've got a a bit of a gap to leap, but I am so confident that we are the people for the job. And the fact that you want to solve this problem and you need it to work makes me so bloody confident that we can bridge this gap for you. And 50K a month will no longer seem like a pipe dream if you give us six months, I promise you. I am so excited. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin and we're going to start by clearly defining who the hell you actually want to work with? Because you've told me throughout this call that you work with agencies that they just give you like the worst, most random leads, right? You've told me you get people who don't have any money. They don't have any commitment. They don't even have any problems with their bloody spine. They just walk in expecting something for free. So we're going to get so damn clear on who you need. So when you're booking appointments, which you will book and you will have people coming in the door, inevitably, and it's what happens when people work with us, the people walking in are the perfect fit for you. We're going to get really clear on that and you're going to set some expectations for exactly what you're looking for in your prospects and that's why this is going to work so well do you see how, like that was just an example but you see my point mm -hmm. that's how you need to pitch you need to be confident you need to be matter of fact you don't need to be like oh my god it's gonna be amazing like because oh, blah, 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 then you sound ridiculous but like <clears throat> conviction in the form of just matter of fact like you're so sure of what you're saying that's how it works okay i got it thank you charlie and also the charlie key, yeah can I throw in another objection and one, maybe give me I was going to yeah. say one second, Hawaii, one second. The key, by the way, is don't try. Mm -hmm. This is a massive paradox in sales. When you're pitching, you don't want to try. You just want to let it happen. And what I mean by that is if you have genuine conviction in your ability to help someone, let's say, for example, that you have a, you could go back into what Alex Hormozzi says. You could go back in time 15 years ago and convince yourself 15 years ago to buy Bitcoin and you knew it was going to go well, you could go back in time to convince yourself or your mum or something, you wouldn't have to try to, to manipulate your tone to sound good to sell Bitcoin. You would just, you would be unrelent, you'd have unrelentless conviction knowing it's the truth and you wouldn't have to try to conjure that up. If you try when you're pitching people to sound a certain way, it will always sound wrong. What you want to do is trust yourself and let your knowledge of your competence and their problem generate an emotion in you that leads you to speak in a way that like for example i'm explaining this to you right now with conviction because i know it's the right answer and not trying to sound a certain way just it's because i know it's the truth and i have confidence in my ability to know the answer that i can tell it to you in a way that's compelling and that makes you believe me i'm not thinking like oh, fuck, how, how do i uh, this word or that word or like should i bring it up at this point or down like it just sounds unnatural so yeah but why go for it mate what are we going to say is it all right if I throw in an objection at you and then you come, with a, come up with a rebuttal? Sure. Yeah. So, so the thing is, like, we would love to work with you. But the thing is, we just um, hired two new trainers in our gym. So currently we don't, I don't think we don't have the budget 
right now to work with you. Is it all right if we come back with you, um, to you maybe in December? Yeah, of course. I'm so glad you brought that up because obviously if you're hiring two new trainers, it means things are going well. And that makes me really happy for you guys. So congratulations on that. Um, I have a habit, why, of struggling to take no for an answer when I can see that someone's a bloody good fit for us. Do you mind if I just try and angle something here to see if I can overcome this objection? Sure. Lovely. Right, that makes me happy. First thing um, is I totally get it, right? If you've just stretched yourself a little bit thin financially, you've got these two new trainers in the gym, I get it. Here's my angle, and here's what I'm trying to help you understand. Those two new trainers need to be put to work. What we've established throughout this call is you've got a problem with generating customers. If you've hired two people, what are they going to do if you haven't got a way to actually fill up their calendars and get them actually booking and working with people, right? They might not have anything to do. Second thing is you said you love the idea of working with us, which also makes me really happy. Why? What makes you say you'd love the idea of working with us? Because I think that you, you know, we connected really well in the beginning throughout the call and and so far, I think that you have been, you know, I've been pitched like this a few times already. Even so far, you the, I'm the most, I find that you, I connected with you the most. So, yeah. Perfect. So what we've established then is we need someone to solve the problem. You trust us, you believe us, and you know we can do it. But I also sense that there's just a little bit of doubt creeping in because you stretch yourself a little bit thin. This is exactly why we have the guarantee we have and exactly why we protect your investment with us. Because the last thing I would want is for you to hire a team and then pay us and not be able to pay the team because we didn't do our job. And I understand why you might be afraid of that, but that's exactly why we have the guarantee. So from my perspective, I promise you from the bottom of my heart, you do not have anything to worry about because I will come hell or high water, get you those appointments and get those trainers busy. What do you say? It yeah, sounds pretty good. Cool. You get it? Yeah, it sounds really cool. Um, cool yeah. Thank you. Good to know I haven't lost my touch, eh? <laughs> um, the main thing with objection, guys, is just like, you have to have this confidence in yourself to just not take no for an answer. It's kind of like the key thing. So, yeah. Um, what offer did you start to get the ball rolling? How did you evolve it into a course? And what do you recommend me to do? Dude, just start with a done for you offer, guarantee paper appointment, something that makes it risk reversal. And then you kind of evolve into a course once your done for you system is unique and you're getting results for people, not by emulating what other people have done. So what we, it, we, we turned into a course eventually because we had like 60 done for you clients and it was just hell. Um, but the re it was time to do that when we had our own unique way of getting people results. You, you don't want to build a course based on what you've copied from other people because then it's not yours and you can't. You need to be able to teach not only like the surface level of everything that you've built, like, oh, so here's the copy we use, but you need to explain why you built it that way. And you're not, you can't start a course by just giving people the copy. You need to teach them how you arrive at that point. Otherwise, you're not teaching them jack shit. You're just it's a done for you solution. You're giving them the copy. And then um, I wouldn't recommend you do a course for until you've got like 50k a month. And you've yeah, but um, my question is the done for you service, you mean on the side of the appointments, right? Or the sales for the gym as well? No, just done for you um, appointments. And what do you think is, would it be smart just to uh, maybe give them like a quick like script for their sales team? Mm hmm. So we, added value or maybe like just basically translate whatever because sales are pretty universal you know it's not like so maybe just translate what you said maybe in a, in a I fast think there's actually, way there's the sales training that we gave to clients in the gym growth accelerator i think just use that okay just do, do that translate it um and tell them look there's no problem i'll do all the booking and here's if you follow this and then what do you think about maybe attaching a guarantee to the um, Maybe do a growth guarantee, but do it. No, because you can't no? control whether or not they're actually going to follow the stuff you give them. Okay. So just an appointments booked guarantee? Yeah. Okay. And how many do you think? Depends how much ad spend there is. 
um, if I do the, if I craft it in the way that you explain the course where you do the database and then from those money of those clients, you spend it on ads. You should be able to get at least 3% of the list as appointments, if not 10%, three to 10%, have a thousand leads, you get 30 appointments. Okay. Of the database, right. That they have. And can I structure the deal saying, look, um, and I also watched the Trojan horse thing. You said, I didn't understand it quite well, but maybe don't you think it's a good idea to be, be like, look, here's a retainer just so you, um, work with us, right? So you are committed, blah, 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 blah. And if I don't, um, with the free leads that, um, I provide from the high level stuff, you have to use that budget to ad spend. And if you do that and we do not bring, I don't know, X amount no, of leads. Way too, way too complicated. You should be able to explain your offer like that. You just need to say to them, Hey, we're going to come in run database reactivation. Everything we make through database reactivation is pay per appointment. And then once you're happy with that, we can set up a retainer to do Facebook ads for you. It'll be this amount of money. We'll guarantee this amount of appointments. Okay. So I, so I should use the paid per appointment. I still do, like... I'd still do a guarantee with retainer. Yeah. Okay. But the, the pay per appointment stuff, I should do it just to gain their trust basically to run to Facebook I would, ads. Dude, I would pitch both at the beginning. But if they, if they don't make a decision, you say, all right, well, let's just run with the paper appointment for now on, on the database reactivation. Don't, don't pitch okay. the DR and then retainer if it works. Pitch them both and then just fall back on the DR if they don't want to pay up front. Not even, so should I just pitch, look, I will give you X amount of leads, right? Uh, I, all I need is um, X amount of budget for ad spend. And if, if not, um, I'll, I'll do the work for free and just cover the ad spend or maybe money back or whatever. And if they say no, then I'll say, look, so you can trust us out of the database uh, per pay, paid per appointment, and you can use that money for ad spend. Yeah. Okay, but should, I, feel I should pitch both of the services first. Yeah, I pitch them both. And how much money should I pitch uh, so they spend on ad spend? The more, the better. I wouldn't do anything less than $750 a month. Okay. And how much should I charge, like in general? How much do you feel you're worth? I have never done it, so yeah. Zero. So I can't, I can't tell you what you should and shouldn't charge because you need to pick the price based on what you feel comfortable selling. If I say, but, because if it was me, I would charge. If it was me, I'd be like three, four grand a month. But if you try and sell three or four grand a month, you probably won't do as well because you're not going to feel like that's what you're worth with the current knowledge you have. So it's up to you. You have to, you have to pick that one. It, it, what I can tell you, man, is like, you will, you will basically, when it comes to pricing, you will be able to charge what you believe you can charge. Like what you believe is fair and what you believe you are worth is what you can, what you will eventually like default to charging on the phone. Yeah. But for the beginning, uh, should I just not charge in testimonial or, or charge? Like what, do you, what do you think is fair? I've never run ads, so I don't know how much money I can make them. But just intuitively, like, what do you think would be fair based on how you feel? It really depends on the results I can get them. Mm -hmm. But so if you're guaranteeing um, them, you could do it like this, where you get them, you charge a thousand dollars a month and you guarantee them $50. You guarantee them. Okay. You charge a thousand dollars retainer. You guarantee 50 appointments, which puts each appointment value at $20. And if you make less than 50 appointments, you refund the difference. So if you only get them 40 appointments, then you refund them 10 times 20. 10. So if each oh, okay, thousand dollars, 50 appointments, anything less than 50 will refund you the difference. If I only get you 25 appointments, I'll refund you $500. What's the closing rate of a gym average? You know, the numbers probably of every appointment they have. And I know it depends what average. Like 25%. 25%. But that might not be the same for. Gym yeah, I know. In, yeah. But it's a general rough idea. It's, it's probably between 15 and 30. You know, I don't think they're going to go like 100 or zero. Okay. Mm, yeah, I'll do that. And then when I get confidence, uh, I will charge more. And maybe I can do that lower so they are actually really happy with the service and they can give a testimonial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. 
All right, guys, um, we've got a few more questions here. I'm going to run through the ones that are left in the chat, and then we're going to call it a day. Um, thoughts on weekly marketing meetings with clients versus Loom video updates? We have done weekly marketing meetings with our clients with intention of building better relationship and improve retention. But as I scale, yeah, I would just, I wouldn't even do it weekly. I'd do it bi-weekly or monthly and just send them a Loom. Like, we didn't even, like, when we had North Flow and Full Flow, we did no reporting for clients. Like we, they had access to the ads manager, but for as long as they were getting a flare of appointments, they didn't really care. But yeah, I would just do a loom every two weeks or every month. Okay. All right. Thank you. Cool. What process do you have in the back of your mind during the sales call? The one that I teach in the program. Question, pitch, answer, handle. Have you ever had a problem with Loom integration to email? I cannot integrate it into some emails. But in others, it works. I'm talking about the Loom logo next to the send button and the feature that enables you to integrate the video. That's a question for the Facebook group, mate. And there's a lot of people that have solved that problem on specific browsers. So if you pop that in the Facebook group, um, then you'll get an answer. Charlie, which books would you recommend on sales, business, and marketing? Um, I actually made a YouTube video on this. I'll find it. If you watch this video, it will explain um, the best books for different topics. And in the description, there's a um, there's like a Google Doc that will show you like books by topic. Charlie, would you say email personalization is viable even if the service offer is good yeah yeah i would um all right guys i'm gonna wrap it up here uh any other questions pop them in the chat and i'll see you lovely lot on friday or monday next week take care guys peace out ciao